back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, your host, and this is October. We are now only 18 to w- days away from the next municipal election here in Calgary and across the province of Alberta. And today we are sitting down with Ward 2 candidate, uh, Francis Arania. Francis, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for having me on your show, Chris. Uh, Francis, uh, if you've watched the show before, you probably know what the first question is going to be. But where's your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, that uh, actually got instilled uh, from my parents and uh, the culture which we have. Uh, so I hail from uh, India and very close-knit uh, family ties. Uh, so that's family life. Uh, and when you talk about uh, culture, when you talk about uh, creativity, when you talk about being out in uh, public, the cosmopolitan vibes, uh, you know, it's, it's all... Put in together, I, I think it's a concoction of everything. So I think that's the best way to put it. You can give back in many ways. Um, you can give back through nonprofit organizations. You can give back through volunteerism. But you chose the political route. Why? Well, that's that's a great question. And again, that's also one of the widely asked uh, ones. Uh, uh, I've been more than a decade uh, in Calgary, and uh, what I liked about Calgary is the people and the warmth that they bring, and of course the expertise as well. Volunteered for more than a decade, very active volunteer, one of the brand ambassadors for um, uh, blood services to the food bank, to the archdiocese of Calgary, to various organizations, and uh, I, I did see that you know it was time to give back to my ward at a city level because uh, I do represent. Uh, uh, community leadership as well. I used to be part of the board of directors uh, with uh, the community I live in, which comes under Ward 2 of Evanston. So I thought, uh, why not take it a notch higher and give people what they want? And people literally wanted a commoner who've uh, been at the grassroots level, who've done everything uh, what a commoner would do and actually excelled in life. So I've seen those things, and I want to replicate back them at uh, the city hall and uh, make people's voices uh, here loud and clear. So uh, as any candidate should be doing, because uh, this is an election and you should be trying to represent the views of your constituents, Ward 2, what are you hearing at the doors? As you door knock, as you talk to the constituents at your door, because I've looked on your website, I see what your platform is, but what are the people of Ward 2 telling you that needs to be addressed in Ward 2, but also at a larger level, the city of Calgary? Well, uh, seriously speaking, uh, till two weeks back, it was, uh, are you from a federal party? Trust me. So uh, around about 30% of the population don't even know of that uh, difference between uh, the municipal and federal election. But uh, having said that, yes, uh, the uh, whole thing, uh, I I could segregate them into uh, short-term, mid-term, and long-term. So something to look at short-term, what we're hearing is uh, job recovery. The unemployment rate has gone about 10%. A lot of our youth, which uh, constitute 38% of our population, are unemployed. Uh, Next is uh, small businesses, which my uh, platform uh, talks about, uh, helping them and helping them recover and uh, get back to normal. And last is uh, systemic racism. There's been a raise in hatred, raise in uh, crime, uh, raise in uh, domestic violence and addictions. And uh, mental wellness is something which uh, we have to work on. I, w- I want to talk about those four areas because this is the great thing about this show. As anyone who's listened to the show, you know that what people address at the door is what the question line of questions Absolutely. is going to be. So I want to start with one that you, you just talked about, which is systematic racism. How do we address that as a city? How do you address that as a city councillor for Ward 2 if you were elected on October 18th? Well, uh, it's something which is tough, but not impossible. And it all starts uh, by educating people. So uh, I would recommend that we start off with the young youth because uh, uh, let's say what you actually get into them stays much more better. And you should ask them to train their parents. You should ask them to train their peers. So that's how you spread the word. You know, and It's very easy to mold a little plant when it grows. But when it uh, forms into a huge tree, it's very difficult to do these things, right? So the molding has to be done at a very early stage. Uh, what we have to do is open centers for divinity where most of the religions are showcased. And trust me, Chris, most of the religions just talk about is uh, helping humans, uh, about uh, humanity and uh, giving back to the community. It's our version which we take back and which we act uh, and add on to our ideology which actually causes all these problems. 
So uh, I feel if we educate them, if we give them these centers, if we preach to them and, and tell them, like for example, India. India has Hinduism. India has uh, yoga to offer all the sides of it, right? It's just not about uh, nationalism and uh, Hinduism and certain uh, religions we are talking about. So once we address those, I think we've addressed 70% uh, of the root causes, and then we can talk about uh, integrating people into these uh, aspects. You, I'm gonna ask this question. The only reason I'm asking this question is because you, you use the word systematic racism at, that you're hearing out the door. Do you believe that Calgary is a systematic racist city, or do you think it's not? Well, this is something which you don't see, and people <laughs> do not. Yeah, that's why it is uh, invisible. It's invisible, but people do feel it. But trust me, uh, Chris, I have never felt it. Uh, a lot of people say that because uh, I'm a Christian, and uh, I've got those broader views. But what I have to tell people is, when you come to Canada, why don't you marinate yourself with the local culture here? learn uh, the culture uh, in Calgary, meet people, go and volunteer at different organizations. So that's how you acclimatize yourself yeah. to the local culture. So even when people say something, you don't take it in a wrong way because that's culture here, right? So for example, you know, certain words, uh, certain foul language used out here is taken for granted, whereas back home into their country, it's, it's a big thing. You're not supposed yeah. to say those things, right? So I think such small differences if not being addressed, just grow and uh, get higher. We are a very diverse city. I think you are well aware of that. I'm yes. well aware of that. We are is currently in Ward 10, which is probably one of, if not the most diverse ridings in the whole city. Currently residing, he's representing Ward 2. I should mention that he is Ward 2. He is in Ward 10 right now, sitting down for the interview. Um, I want to ask the question, and this goes to representing everyone. We are very diverse. How do you envision yourself and why are you the best candidate to represent everyone at City Hall? Well, uh, to begin with, I think uh, that's how, uh, you know, they call it humble beginnings. When I came here a decade back, uh, I wiped off my slate clean and started off from the lowest level. So my first job was uh, $10 an hour. I still uh, remember that and started off as a dishwasher as a janitor, despite having my international qualifications for which I got qualified as a permanent resident. I embraced the culture. I was like, that's a learning curve for me. And as I moved on, I, I took various assignments and jobs and I climbed the corporate uh, ladder. I still use the public transport, so I can really understand what goes through people's minds uh, when uh, they sit out there in minus 40 and waiting for a bus to come by and they talk about uh, public transport infrastructure lacking. I can completely understand. I still drive my Uber, which, uh, yeah, which I did uh, off late and still do skip the dishes, just like every other normal person, work very hard for a living. And when you work hard for a living, you want your tax dollars, whatever you paid, to be put to good use. So I am generally, at the moment, on the other end of the spectrum and trying to reverse uh, sides and get on the other end and help people. I, I want to talk about tax dollars because this is the great thing about the show. If anyone's listened to it before, this show, while I have an idea of where it's going to go, it's always going to go somewhere different each episode because it depends on what you say. Um, you, you mentioned that people want their tax dollars used and uh, uh, spent wisely. On your website, you have the words fiscal responsible for responsibility on your website. Before I get into this line of questions, I want to ask for you, from your perspective, what does that mean? What does fiscal responsibility mean? Well, uh, it's actually responsible uh, spending. Uh, uh, it, it could be in any way, you know, balancing budgets to personally uh, not spending those dollars uh, properly or uh, questions about integrity. I don't want to mention any names here, uh, but uh, it so happens that the people in Ward 2 uh, have uh, lost their trust and it all uh, is a vicious cycle and it's all about getting their trust back just uh, in common man's uh, terms, I would say. But uh, understand one thing, 30% of the job is only winning these elections. 70% of the job is actually delivering all those things once you get elected. And it's n not an easy job because when you get there, things are very difficult, very different. You need those sets of minds uh, which are working together with you, your so-called co-worker, counselors, and mayors to get along on the same page. So it is a difficult task. 
How do we do that though? How do we get people back to the table and discuss spending wisely? Because you, you've you probably been an observer of politics as much as I have, and you see that this city council is very dysfunctional when it comes to certain issues, especially when it comes to budget. Getting 15 people to agree on an issue is quite hard in this term. How do you bring back civility to City Hall, but also ensure that our money is being spent wisely and spent equally fairly across all ridings? Chris, have you watched the movie 12 Angry Men? <laughs> yes. Okay, so let me get back to that. Uh, of course, uh, uh, what was said probably 50 years back, it still holds the same. So in which uh, it's, there is a jury which uh, actually, you know, would come with their preconceived notions into the room from different walks of life, and they all want to get out of the room because they've got chores to run. And the verdict which is given is guilty. Whereas you have one gentleman who thinks that, no, we have to have the benefit of doubt. Comes with facts and figures, takes a couple of the hours of time, and he actually tells them, we're dealing with someone's life here. He could be in prison for 25, 30 years, or he could get the capital punishment, and manages to convince the rest 11. So that's what my job would be. Come with the facts and figures, try and explain to these people, probably offline or probably in front of everyone, that this is critical, this is something which needs to be done. How can we bridge the gap? How can we balance budgets? And probably, hopefully, I think uh, when there is uh, positive people who come in there, they could influence everyone else and uh, we could move uh, towards a common goal. How do you bridge the gap from City Hall to people, though? Because... I talk to my neighbors, I talk to people across the city, and I hear time and time again, people get elected, they go off to City Hall, and we never hear from them again until the next election. How do you change that? What are you going to address to ensure that you are staying connected with your uh, uh, your constituents? You are getting the best information from your residents. How do you envision doing that? Well, it's very, very simple. Let's not reinvent the wheel here. We could have Citizens of the Week awards. Uh, you go to each community. You could go and help the seniors, which I currently do. Mm -hmm. Ask them what problems do they face. Have a little vision board in each community. We've got 12 communities. Ask the uh, residents to get out there and put on their vision boards what actually they need us to do. So that's how you gather a lot of feedback. And... Uh, Lastly, yeah, when you have all these things together, you could, uh, yeah, you have to listen well, of course, and uh, you have to take this back to the city hall and see how you can implement uh, these ideas. One of the areas that you didn't talk about when the short term, what people want addressed in Ward 2 was COVID-19. But I want to talk about it because it is the elephant that is going to be around the council table every single day for the next few years. We are in a recovery. We are trying to recover from this pandemic as quickly as possible, but politics moves very slowly. How do you envision ensuring that everyone gets a fair shot, a fair shot at recovery, but also getting ahead from the oil collapse and this pandemic? Well, it's, it's, it's a great road ahead. So uh, I could say something, but as you said, it works uh, slow-paced, uh, so it might take its uh, own time. The whole thing would be come up with an uh, economic uh, recovery plan. Uh, now, uh, talk to Calgary Economic Development. There are a lot of these institutions who've done a lot of hard work, who've run a lot of statistics. Get all these minds together, sit together with them, and ask people, as uh, a public servant, uh, I think it's fair to say, that get a lot of feedback from the people who live in your area, what exactly they want. So get a combination of everything going and propose something to the city hall and see what other people from different wards, as you know, it's just not my ward. We work as Calgary as a whole, have on table and take it on from there. It seems easy. Seems like something that you could be doing right now. Are you? Are you talking to these organizations? Because... You have a lot of ground to cover in the first month if elected on October 18th because you will be elected on October 18th, the week after you will be sworn in, and then you will have budget in November that you will have to pass. So while it's great that we can do this all afterwards, but we need it now. So are you doing the groundwork now? Are you talking to these organizations? Absolutely. So uh, whilst uh, my election campaign, I've met more than 13,000 people. I'm yeah. so happy that I've knocked more than 13,000 doors uh, and met more than 200 small businesses. I can uh, 
uh, I can actually relate uh, to these business owners by name. And uh, it's been a year now. I helped them uh, go on an uh, online model when everything started off uh, by posting things online, helping them open up a website. A lot of them, their property taxes were increased. Renewal of licenses helped them in different ways. And it's, it's, you know, success is just a byproduct of everything. So I help them with those things. And they come back to me now saying, Francis, you know, you helped me when we needed you. Why don't you put your lawn sign here? Why don't you put your advertisement here? Because we want to show to all our residents that you've really helped us out. So it's always, uh, you know, being symbiont, you know. They say the better you are, the more you give, the more you will receive in return. So, yes, I have been working at the grassroots level, and I understand and know about uh, a lot of these small businesses. Uh, what are they up to? So uh, you mentioned that small businesses was one of the issues that you, you're hearing at the door. I want to know specifically what are you hearing about small businesses? How can the city of Calgary help our small business community? Well, uh, mostly it is the taxes, to do with, <laughs> just to be precise. That's the first thing which yep. uh, people uh, talk about. And now when you talk about uh, the tax ratio uh, for uh, between the residential and the commercial, if it's uh, a dollar with the residential, it's 4.25, uh, 4 I guess, at the moment. And uh, the Canadian average is somewhere close to, for uh, you know major cities, is 3.1. 3.1, which means if you're paying $1,000 tax, uh, they'll be paying uh, $3,100 tax. So what we should do is try and lower these out and balance uh, it somewhere. And we should look out for more revenue generation, you know, rather than spending and rather than uh, taxing uh, these people. Uh, around about uh, 2.8 to 2.9 is pretty favorable, which would get their taxes lowered by 20% precisely, you know. Okay on an average, which, which is wonderful, you know. So uh, even if you give them a $5 rebate a month, they're very happy about it. So these all these little uh, pennies which you save makes a big difference. Um, wow. It's great that we want to play, we want to reduce uh, small uh, business uh, taxes. And I, you said you want to balance it out somewhere else. I'm going to play devil's advocate here Absolutely. for a second. Absolutely. Because... Someone says they're going to cut, cut uh, taxes somewhere. Mm -hmm. As a homeowner, I'm going, okay, you're going to cut taxes there. You're going to raise my taxes as a homeowner. Can you say that that's not going to happen? Or how do you envision helping small businesses but not on the back of residents? We have to come up with crazy ideas. You know, one of them, of course, uh, uh, I would be probably, uh, you know, uh, people would procrastinate uh, a lot uh, about this comment. But then I have to say that most of the population who works in Calgary do not stay in Calgary. They come from just a neighboring. Mayor, I don't want to mention yeah, names, yeah. but you just. Oh, met. I will. I will. <laughs> come move to Calgary. Yes. So <laughs> why don't we look at a little toll for them, which. If you talk about developed countries like Dubai, like Singapore, if you come to Singapore and you live outskirts, you have to pay that toll. You have to pay a congestion tax, which in turn gets people revenues. Now, Chris, uh, don't forget, 75% uh, of cities' revenues come from taxes. Yeah. So it's a trade-off. So if we give them rebates, we have to get that from somewhere. And second is attracting uh, more uh, businesses. Uh, go ahead, go out there, go around the world, uh, get into something called as medical tourism. I do not know if you've heard about it. Like uh, you go for a dentistry package uh, to Singapore, uh, they charge you around 3000 bucks. Your airfare is covered, your stay is covered, and your dental thing is covered. So why doesn't Calgary come with something like that? So people come with those ideas, and people come with their money. Of course, we are going to be catering to a certain set of people who come to ski and who would like to get their dental work done as well. So you have to come up with these crazy ideas which actually generate revenues, you know, from vertical farming to whatever, whatever. Just think out of the box, which people have not done. Now, what happens in politics is uh, generally people have these terms. So first term is all about giving back. Second term gets to be a habit. And after second term, if you go to the third term, fourth term, it's all about ego and complacency. So for me, I just want to serve my two terms and get off. Okay, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt here because yeah. I have heard a lot of candidates sit in that chair and sitting on this computer and say I'm gonna serve two terms. Everyone says that when they're about to get elected to get elected, and then after the second term, it is. I, I've enjoyed it. I'll I'll do another third term. I'll do another fourth term. What guarantees can you put in place to ensure that the citizens will? only see two terms for Francis? Or is it just 
We have to take you at your word. You have to take me on my word because you've heard me on record here, <laughs> and this is going to air and reach millions of uh, Calgarians. So in eight well years, me. eight years time, yes, if sir. you are elected, I'm coming to you and I'm saying you're on, you're done. You're on. <laughs> I'm yes. doing it to every councillor who yes. who said that. Absolutely, and uh, make no mistake, I've signed a pledge as well. Uh, that I'm not going to do more than uh, two terms. And you could see that uh, coming on my website soon. Um, I want to talk about youth a little bit here as well, because you seem to be a, a guy who has a lot of great ideas and willing to think outside the box. Our youth unemployment is huge. We are seeing our youth go, to, go off to college university in Vancouver, in Toronto, and not coming back to the city. How do we retain the youth, keep them here, and also get businesses to start hiring our youth because people are struggling right now. You say youth is youth unemployment's high, but it's not just here in Calgary. It's all across the city. So how do you attract businesses to retain youth, but also bring back youth who have left the city? Well, uh, I do work for a private company, and it's all about uh, a part of it is getting new blood into the organization. And how we do that is... Uh, we approach different institutions uh, from uh, management uh, to culinary to different uh, set uh, of skills which they have. So we have to look here is uh, that bifurcation of how many students pass out every year and what's their stream and then go back to those potential employers around the globe, give them incentives to open something here so that if people have invested into Calgary, the students uh, for their careers, you tell them that, hey, after this investment of four years or eight years, your bachelor's and master's, I'm sure and certain that you will be getting a job here in your sector. And then go back to those employers and make it happen. Give them incentives so that you retain that local talent because we're not doing that at the moment, trust me. And third largest city in Canada and much more affordable than the top two cities, Calgary has so much to offer, but uh, it's still not tapped its potential. While we have not tapped our potential, other cities are struggling as well. They're doing the exact same thing. What idea, what outside-the-box idea have you been playing around with or towing with to say, okay, if we tried this, we could see a potential increase of people coming back to the city. We could be attracting new businesses to the city because I think people in this election want someone to come to the council chambers who has ideas. Even if they're far-fetched, even if they're completely out to left field, they want people with ideas. What will you say or do, to not say or do, but what idea are you bringing to council to say, okay, we haven't looked at it this way. Let's look at it this way. Well, as I told you, medical tourism. So tourism... And, and I appreciate yep. that, and I, I get that, and I know that's one area, but yep. specifically with youth, mm -hmm. specifically with youth, how do what outside the box? Because I've had numerous counselors, uh, candidates on the show, and they seem to give me the canned answer. And you seem to be the only one who's not giving me a canned answer. So, <laughs> what outside the box to attract our youth to bring them back? Well, I, I think uh, whilst they sign up for any of these programs, uh, we, we should talk about uh, campus placement and we should talk about a roadmap ahead for us. Uh, Ask them to write up a five-year plan, where they want to go, and uh, what industry they want to go with. So once you have all the statistics and data, you could go back to the Calgary Economic Development. You could go back to those uh, provincial partners and federal partners at different levels of government and start working from there, uh, working backwards or working a different way around. So how to get these companies? Like a very simple example was vaccines. Like if Canada had the only thing called vaccines, and if we could manufacture them here, we wouldn't have relied heavily. Like till date, we rely so much on our synergy partners, right? Uh, and we're still proud and talking about a maple syrup and poutine. But apart from that, what extra do we have? So this is what uh, we have to speak to these youth. Uh, we should rely a lot, and I think Canada does, on uh, international students. They get huge amount of revenue, right? Uh, Simon Fraser University just got a grant from the government of uh, British Columbia uh, towards uh, you know building their new campuses and attracting uh, international students. So that actually gets revenue. That actually allows uh, employers to come out there seeing that, oh, there's a million dollar investment which is done into universities, research. Uh, so why don't we come here and why don't uh, we create jobs? Mm. 
Sorry, I'm just making sure that I've covered all the notes that I've done. As a candidate, everyone has an idea that they want changed. We've talked about what you're hearing at the doors, but you got into this election because you wanted to help people. What specifically did you see that people needed help with? Because I, I, I appreciate you talking about job recovery, youth unemployment, small business, and systematic racism. But you had to have had an idea or two that you said, I want to change this. No one's been addressing this. What is that issue for you? Well, uh, I think people have fairly the same ideas. You know, the basic needs of human being are still food, shelter, and clothing, and everything revolves around it. Uh, yes, you add recreation uh, to it which is very important, uh, whereas uh, you add accessibility to it. When you see uh, the older neighborhoods which we have, they lack accessibility. Like I went and I spoke to an older gentleman. Uh, he, he actually told me, talking about youth empowerment, what about seniors? 15 to 18 percent of our ward population is about the age of 60 and close to retire. What do we have? Like uh, these are empty spaces, but we don't have a farmer's market here. I, I just want someone who could bake fresh bread here, who could make me cocktails here. We could probably play some games here, darts, whatever, in summer. So they keep us engaged because we've contributed towards these communities, and this is what we need. So listening to their ideas, uh, helping those old neighborhoods, making uh, great planning with uh, builders so that our newer neighborhoods are built much properly, and especially with snow removal and especially certain things. Uh, we came up with an idea within our community to have volunteers you know, uh, get uh, the snow plowed, and uh, it really worked well. So why not uh, think outside the box? Why not uh, have uh, these volunteers professionally trained, tie up with Canadian Tires or Lowe's or whoever who could sponsor certain equipment? And there's a lot of way of doing you know, these things, but all that needs is planning in place. And People are willing to hear the new ideas. People want a change. Two of the biggest infrastructure projects that the next council will have to deal with. Well, uh, Green Line. Uh, yes, yes, you said the it. arena. <laughs> I'm yes. gonna, I'm, I'm calling them out because I've asked all the municipal candidates where they stand on this. Um, the Green Line is unofficially officially approved. Uh, I think everyone's still waiting to see if the shovel will actually go in the ground, and hopefully by the time this is airing. A shovel will be in the ground. Where do you stand on the Green Line? Well, I was pro-infrastructure, especially with uh, the Green Line, because uh, you need it. Any thriving city, you know, whether you see uh, from Los Angeles to Dubai to Singapore to Malaysia, thrive on its uh, public transport. And uh, we didn't have that. We lacked that. And if we want to showcase ourselves towards the world, saying this is what we need. Say, for example, uh, uh, m people know where is Banff, but once they land into the airport, they seldom have any means to get into Banff. Like, I was an advocate for that. Why don't we have a monorail or something which takes people directly to Banff? And, you know, it pays for itself over a period of time. I know these costs are huge, but if we can work through all levels of uh, government, uh, which we did, uh, things can be sorted out. The other one is the arena deal. The new, uh, sorry, entertainment center or art center or however you want to call it down in uh, downtown for the flames, but also for venues for trade shows and all that. What's your opinion on that? Well, I think we need to have that. If we have to showcase ourselves as an international city, we need to have that. Of course, there will be hiccups, there will be pandemics which will come in, which will uh, deter things, which will put things on the back burner. But if you're thinking of a long-term vision, you have to benchmark yourself with a thriving city which is built over a period of time because of infrastructure. And uh, trust me, uh, Joe Maglioka, uh, who is the incumbent in Ward 2, did a lot in terms of infrastructure uh, with Ward 2, and he was a big advocate for infrastructure. I like him for that. What projects or infrastructure projects are the people of Ward 2 talking about right now? What things are they wanting? Are they wanting their sidewalks paved? Are they wanting their roads paved? Because infrastructure is one of the biggest things, but also one of the things that you don't realize is always happening around you because road construction and all that. Well, a lot of parks. A lot of parks <laughs> is what they are looking at. It's, it's a residential neighborhood which is growing uh, rapidly. And uh, towards the boundaries where Evanston is, we are getting three new communities. So all they're looking at is an accessible park. Uh, uh, they're looking at uh, an unleashed dog park. They're looking at paved roads. They're looking at better intersections for connectivity. And uh, lastly is uh, schools. 
as what uh, I've been told. Like uh, for a parent uh, to send their kids to certain schools, there's a school bus uh, which is not available or they are full. They have to take the public transport. So that's a lot of grievances uh, which uh, parents have uh, lodged in. We are living in a, like I said, very diverse community, but also a very political community. People are engaged as much as I don't think they are currently right now in August, uh, August when we're recording this, but in October, hopefully people will be engaged. I want to ask this question because this is, this is going to tell me how you will be as the next counselor. You will have people from all viewpoints coming to you and asking you to bring things forward, not vote on certain issues, vote on certain issues a certain way. How do you plan on addressing issues that are controversial that some people may not agree with your vote and some people may? Well, Chris, that's, that's a great question. And I strongly feel uh, you cannot please 100% of the population. That what? goes Come everywhere. On. That goes everywhere. Come on, give and take, you'll have some people who'll still sit out there and procrastinate uh, your decisions which have been taken. You know, uh, History has proven that. Come on. Yes. I don't need to reiterate <laughs> that. Uh, in fact, uh, people are so happy and they clap hands and they wish all the best when we get elected. And after a few months, they're like, uh, oh, these projects, these were the expectations which are not met. I, I give you sympathy because you think a few months is going to pass before people start. <laughs> it's going to be the day after, man. We're already in October. You see, I've just got three weeks left for uh, my election. So, yes, uh, all you have to do is you have to prioritize. So human wants are unlimited, but resources to satisfy them are limited. So all we have to do is prioritize these issues. See what's more important, see what's less important, and grade them that way. Uh, it goes back to the, the, I'm glad you answered it that way because this next question sort of piggybacks onto that. You are one vote of 15 on the next council. You are one vote, and sometimes Ward 2 will have to go without. While you were there to advocate for people of Ward 2, you also have to look at the bigger picture. You have to prioritize. And sometimes wards will have to go without. While we try our best, it's not going to happen that everyone's going to get what they want. How do you approach your constituents and say, while we are working as a city to move forward, we may not be able to get to your sidewalk, maybe not be able to get to your road as quickly as you want. It is on our radar, but this year we had other important roads in Ward 4 in Ward 10, in Ward 12, that needed to get done before we do this one? Well, I think people uh, get to understand these things uh, much more before I would be even addressing this because everyone is so hooked up on uh, social media and the news. Uh, so they make my life much more easier. So all I have to tell them is this is what we advocated for, and it's all about communication. It's all about those newsletters, those emails, which we send to our ward people. And then you tell them that this is for the betterment of the whole city that uh, there are certain places which did lack them and the budget was more balanced towards them. Having said that, yes, I have to fight for them and I have to advocate for these issues because that's where I live in and they have chosen me uh, as a representative to represent uh, them at uh, the city hall. I appreciate you answering that question. This is the fun part for me. This is the fun part of the interview for me. Put on your time hat. You're going to jump forward 18 days. On October 18th, you are the newly elected counselor for Ward 2. October 19th, you wake up. What is priority number one for you? Oh, I think getting dressed. <laughs> 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 taking, taking the public transport and getting to City Hall on time is going to be a priority for me because I still use the public transport and uh, people can take me for this. Uh, whilst doing my time in a public office, I would love to take the public transport and go to office. And I want all my counselors to lead by example. That's something called the simplicity. And, uh, you know, once you do that, you gain people's trust. Yes. Um, jokes apart, once uh, I reach there, uh, the first issue which I'll be addressing is about uh, the economy about unemployment, about how to help these people recover. And as you rightly pointed, that the budget would be just 30 days away, is to focus a lot on these budgets and to learn. Because uh, let's be fair, I'm inexperienced. Uh, it's it's uh, very easy for me to say these things. But as I told you, 70% of the job is when I actually get on there. 
is to sit there and to understand the whole dynamic of the city and how to balance these budgets. Anyone who has worked, who has a business or who has worked in uh, project management knows that you need to set metrics. You need to set metrics to say, I will accomplish X, Y, and Z by this date. I want to jump for it first hundred days in office. What metrics are you going to put in place to ensure that Francis has a great first hundred days in office so you can go back to the people of Ward 2 and say, you know what, we have started on X, we are working on Y, and it all together we are dealing with Z. What are the, what are the metrics you're going to put in place to ensure that you are successful, but also you can go back to your constituents to say, we are getting this done? Well, 60% uh, of it would be focused on employment and economic uh, recovery. And the rest would be on mental health, uh, fighting, uh, you know, systemic uh, racism and uh, the other issues which are there. So that's the bifurcation, 60 to 40. And first 100 days would be just to lay the groundwork so that we could uh, excel from there on. Thank you for answering that. Now, in order to get to day one, actually, before I ask that question, I want you to look at this camera right here. Talk to the people of Ward 2 who are listening to this and watching this. Why should you be the next city councillor for Ward 2? Well, uh, it's, it's on you to decide. decide. Uh, there are a lot of people who would love to boast about themselves. I, I don't have anything to boast about myself. All I have to say is I've always been a volunteer. I've always been a commoner, and I've helped people in my best uh, capacity. And that's the thing which I have with me, back with people. We're just a family of three, and we came to a no man's land without any friends. And my daughter till date says, Dad, we don't have any relatives. Why are we even in Canada? But I tell them uh, is uh, we've got more than 10,000 people who know us through our affiliations with this volunteering organizations. And that's how I've gained trust, and we've moved and thrived as a family. So personally, as well as professionally. So all I want uh, is a chance to get out there and to prove myself. So I might not be perfect, but what I can say is I can try something on your behalf, and I would try it 100% because I have great passion to do so. In order to get to October 19th, in order to get to your first 100 days, you need to be elected. While I have tried to ask as many questions as we possibly can in our first 40 minutes of the show, I want to ask this. How can people reach out? How can people get involved? How can people donate? How can people pick up a sign? How can people ask you a question if they want something addressed as well? Well, uh, I think people uh, fairly uh, know me by now, uh, thanks to social media. Uh, I'm out there on Facebook. Uh, you could go to my website by visiting the domain uh, www.francisaranab.ca. I'm uh, very much active uh, on Twitter and Instagram as well. So any social media, you just Google my name as well, Francis Arana, and you could see the work which I've done towards uh, the community. Um, for my listeners and to my viewers, those links will be in the show notes, so right below here. Please go and check them out because uh, I'm going to say this over and over again, and I've said this numerous, numerous times, and you will probably get hear, hear it a lot more until October 18th. Get out, get educated, learn about the candidates, address your candidates, ask your candidates questions, because at the end of the day, if you do not vote, I do not want to see you on Twitter complaining about the issues that are facing the city. You need to get out and educate yourself and make sure you vote for the person that, A, best represents your values, but also your morals. And at the end of the day, go out and vote. Vote, 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 vote. Francis, thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure to do this, and I, I wish you all the best on October 18th. We need more people like you in politics. Thank, Thank you so much, Chris. I'm glad you said that. All I need is a lot of blessing and prayers from you. And in God we trust. Thank you. Thank you.